Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfield Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. Coming up, unleashing the creativity of inventors, artists, and designers. We have a number of really talented people that have kind of come out of the woodwork to see their own dreams become a reality, and that's a wonderful thing. And a symbiotic relationship between science and art. By putting this exhibition together, in some ways, we are highlighting ways in which the arts are really related to scientific practices. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting-edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Microprocessors, computer-controlled laser cutters, 3D printers, high-tech tools provide almost limitless opportunities for inventors to bring their ideas to life, but they can be prohibitively expensive. Factor, a shared workspace in Orlando, is helping break through that barrier. Every inventor knows the adage, the right tool for the right job. But how to unleash individuals' creativity when tools can cost tens of thousands of dollars? Factor in downtown Orlando offers one solution to that problem. Factor is a makerspace. The concept of a makerspace is basically a place for people to kind of come, utilize tools they wouldn't be able to afford, to educate the community on how to use these tools. Factor is a labor of love for founder Douglas Brown. I started Factor with the idea that I would be able to surround myself with talented artists, talented entrepreneurs, and talented machinists and mentors to kind of learn myself how the tools are used, by design, the space is many things to many people. We have a wide variety of members. I think that we have a lot of retired individuals that have worked in this industry before. They no longer have a workshop, they don't have even a garage. We also have a lot of new entrepreneurs that are looking to kind of create new companies, new designs, and they don't have the capital to buy the tools themselves or even get the warehouse space required to kind of do production. So we offer that ability for our members to come in, start their companies. Members have access to a number of tools to bring their ideas to fruition. We do 3D printing with laser cutting. Uh, we also do a wood shop and we do a metal shop and we have an electronics room as well. We have a laser machine. It's used for cutting acrylic, for wood, for leather. And the machine itself runs for about $40,000, so it's very difficult for users or members that are starting companies to afford that capital outlay. Most Factor members pay a monthly fee. Others pay with their time and expertise. X Factor is an opportunity here at, at Factor where you can volunteer time to help teach classes or help teach people on different equipment in exchange for the membership fee. I volunteer here in the electronics room. All right, so this is uh, the intro to Arduino. Arduino is a set of open source software and hardware. The intro to Arduino class kind of helps people get started with the Arduino hardware. It teaches a lot of the basics of how to interface with the hardware, a little bit of the coding so that you can learn how to turn an LED on and off, how to get input from a button. By the time you're done, you've got a kind of a basic foundation to help build some type of project that, that you might be interested in. In addition to providing access to expensive tools, Factor serves as a place where ideas can cross-pollinate. I met another member here named Bill Ball, and together we both had a similar vision for a low-cost robot that people could learn about electronics and about robotics and about programming. And so we kind of worked together over a couple months and put together an initial prototype for this robot that our target is trying to keep it under $50. This project really wouldn't have been possible without Factor. Um, really more than anything, it's the opportunity to meet people who have similar interests, but different levels of expertise and different types of expertise. I feel like I'm kind of a creative person and I, and I have a lot of ideas and I like to be able to get those ideas out to a certain point to see if it's worth going further with it and being able to learn the stuff that'll teach other people, you kind of in turn learn a lot about your own ideas. For Douglas Brown, it's also important that Factor welcomes a broad range of creators. We're about as evenly demographic as possible. I mean, the concept there is we have an equal segment of artists that come in here that are looking to expand upon their art. One of the pieces that I'm best known for around town is the dinosaur skull out of cardboard. One of those artists is Bob Barnett. 
I do a lot of work where art and technology meet. I'm very inspired by science fiction. Here I get to work with a lot of great engineers who have taught me a lot about uh, electrical engineering and computer programming. And they're helping me with the process of building a better version of all the different things that I build. This object exists in a niche of its own where it is the intersection of astronomy, computer programming, mechanical design, electronic design, graphic design, interface design. It has so many different aspects that it ties into for this specific piece. You can use it to point at objects in the sky and track them and take photographs of them, or you can use it to map an area of the sky. You could use it also for home security. You could plot the infrared temperatures of crops. I wanted to build it for the common user. It's only about 200 bucks to build the thing, and it's all open source architecture, so you can program it yourself to do what you'd like it to do. Factor may appear to be a cool workshop decked out with cutting edge tools, but ultimately, it's not just about shiny new hardware. Factors is about people. We have a number of really talented people that have kind of come out of the woodwork to come to Factor to kind of see their own dreams become a reality. And that's a wonderful thing because when you work for a job and you have a plethora of tools, but you can only work on those tools for somebody else, it's nice to be able to have the skill set to come someplace and work on those tools for yourself. So that's one of the pride things that we have in Factor. People should be empowered to be able to have the knowledge to, to create the ideas that they have so that they can share them with the world. The Orlando Maker Faire brings together scientists, crafters, tinkerers, tech enthusiasts, and anyone else who wants to showcase their creations in what's billed as the greatest show and tell on Earth. Welcome to the Maker Faire Orlando here at the Orlando Science Center. It is a community-driven event. It is a wonderful celebration of creativity, innovation, of the things we make. And we kind of consider it the, the largest show and tell and in just within the past three years, to look, there are now 3D scanners and printers everywhere. Now it's cool to see that it's consumer level and ready. It's actually a robot based on an inch one. The design is to keep a stable robot that can walk, and even at extremes, an extreme environment, extreme tilts, it still has a point of rigidity. Right behind us is the world's largest arcade machine, standing tall at 15 feet. I have created Pi Play, which is a video game system for the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is a $25 full feature computer, and that's what's actually running that game. The new thing that we brought this year was a brand new robot. He's a demolition robot and he's bright yellow. He walks all around everywhere in his giant robot suit. We really try and make like vintage cool robots that kids would like, but yet have the intricacies with the electronics and lights and everything in them. I love the energy in the building and it's so wonderful to see so many creative, passionate individuals. The reason I keep coming back is the patrons, the makers, the like-minded individuals, pushing the tech to the limits. At Utah State University, the intersection between art and science has come alive in a revolutionary exhibit. A look at the inspiration behind Artsy STEM, the changing climates of the arts and sciences. There's lots of uh, similarities between art and science, particularly at the moment of inspiration, but basically they're, they're both ways for us to understand the world around us and the world within us and how we try to make sense of all of that. Art System, the Change in Climates of the Arts and Sciences is an exhibition currently on view here in our museum that features 25 pieces of artwork by artists who are either inspired by science or are working in some way more directly with the sciences. This exhibition is part of a larger program. The Art System program at Utah State University consists of the exhibition, as well as a series of visiting artists and science lectures. 
My name is Mark Lee Coven. I'm an assistant professor uh, at Utah State University. I'm in the art and design department. The main focus of Art System or RT STEM is really trying to integrate or show how important it is to have that cross-disciplinary integration between disciplines. So typically when you have a scientist working, what you'll have is they'll go out, they'll do the research, and then they'll look for an artist or a designer to hire to then showcase or try and create graphs or websites. I guess the inception of this whole uh, program came from my desire to not be at the tail end of the scientific endeavor, but actually at the inception and also have an influential impact on the entire process. Part of what we have done in this exhibition is tried to show um, through our curatorial lenses the ways that the arts and the sciences are, can really be deeply intertwined. And, you know, STEM, of course, stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And there are other, you know, sort of pushes to change that to STEAM and to include art in part of that. So by putting this exhibition together, in some ways, we are highlighting ways in which the arts are really related to scientific practices. The exhibition features works that are both uh, peripherally related to the sciences and works that are directly engaged with the sciences. One of the ways that it does that is that we incorporate works from people who are either maybe have a science background um, and then went on to make art or people like Brandon Ballinger who have very direct connections with science. All of my art is derived from ecological research. As a scientist, I study amphibians, uh, specifically amphibian declines, like declines in their populations and developmental uh, malformations or deformities. And I get very inspired as I'm doing the science to create art. But all of my art somehow relates to either amphibians like this or other species, mostly relating to loss of biodiversity and other environmental issues. Exhibitions like this are really important because it's a way for the public to come in and see like these kind of potential intersections between art and science and the kind of crossovers that can occur. And also I think at this moment in history, hopefully what we're seeing is like this emergence of more integrated programming where we're realizing that people learn in different ways, they experience in different ways. So using the lens of art and science and combining them as much as we can is just another way to, to get more and more people involved. One of my favorite pieces is the Derek Curry piece, which we hear <laughs> going on in the background right now. Um, and I appreciate it for a couple of reasons. One, because it makes the gallery lively. It's been interesting kind of to see, to have living organisms in the gallery, which is not a thing that we normally do. We're not a science museum. Um, so it's been interesting. But I also think that as the piece has been in the gallery now for about four weeks, um, the, the metaphor that Curry um, is employing to talk about um, speech amplification and um, you know political funding just becomes richer as time goes on and the crickets um, change their environment changes. One of the nice things about the way this exhibition came together is that the curators um, looked at a wide range of works. They looked at works historically that are relevant to the arts and sciences and works that are important today. The, the resulting exhibition includes a really nice combination of uh, local artists, regional artists, and nationally and internationally renowned artists. So it achieves a lot in trying to tell uh, a little bit of a story about the way in which artists and um, scientists uh, are either inspired or influenced by one another, or in some cases, how they can work together. The National STEM Initiative, the push to get kids to study science, technology, engineering, and math, has taken off. But some educators think art has been left behind to students' detriment. We sat down with UCF professor Ryan Bisons to discuss what some are calling the STEAM Initiative. So just first of all, tell me a little bit about the concept of STEAM, what is it? STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, and the A in STEAM stands for Art. So it's the, the addition of the, the arts into the um, mathematical and uh, technological fields. I thought that uh, STEM was created, the concept of STEM was created because 
there was a feeling that not enough students were going into the science fields. Uh, why are we introducing art into the equation now? Arts has been linked into the sciences since the, the Age of Enlightenment and both have a similar yet um, maybe a little bit different approach, but um, an artist is very explorative um, to, to um, whatever concept or ideas that they're exploring, and, and a scientist is the same way. And what about for the artist? What does the artist gain out of getting that grounding in science? The boom in technology and all the new tools and advancement in um, computers and um, things like 3D printing and um, the tangibility of media um, is really starting to transcend the fields and to be inspired or connected to these, these different um, um, technologies or ideas will help inform the artist's work. Ryan Bison, thanks so much for explaining the concept of STEAM to us. Thank you. For most people, microbiology is a field as complex and incomprehensible as science gets. But a University of Michigan professor is deconstructing this specialized branch of biology using, of all things, dance and music. Imagine that I'm in the cell here, and here's part of the cell, and it's an important part, I use this. Autophagy is a process in which our cells break down parts of themselves. As with anything, including furniture, parts of the cell wear out. So how does the cell get rid of these things that are no longer functional? And this is the process of autophagy. Almost every month, there's a new connection being discovered between autophagy and some aspect of human health and disease, cancer, some types of neurodegeneration, diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, various muscle diseases, you name it. That means we have to really understand it if we want to be able to manipulate it for therapeutic purposes. Products F and H are synthesized through the action of enzymes one through seven. I've been teaching introductory biology for over 20 years, and I'm looking for ways to make this subject accessible. And one of the questions I asked was whether short videos or including art would help. David does pretty much everything to, I, I see an exact scale. I had been aware of the paintings of David Goodsell for a number of years. I'd always admired his work, which shows a more realistic depiction of how a cell might be than we typically draw them. Dan contacted me, oh, 10 years ago now, and wanted to do a painting of, about autophagy. At that time, he was not interested because we didn't know enough about the system. The data just wasn't there, but now, but now there's a lot more data at all levels for structures, for concentrations. For We corresponded for months talking about the science behind it. The illustrations I do actually is, is working in a very interesting scale level, which is intermediate between anything we can see experimentally. But you can only get down so, so fine with that because of the size of, uh, of, of light waves. Each time he gets a new discovery in his science, he comes to me asking for a new painting. So it's real fun to see his research progressing and helping him document that. The minute I saw that U of M email through the composers list, I thought, wow, I've always been wanting to do something like that for a long time. So the next evolution of this was to go to Wendy Lee and ask if there was any way she would be willing to collaborate on a musical piece that would represent autophagy. There's one point in the piece that the hand motion has to be like I this. I really want to see that. Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited about this because I had always wanted to collaborate with scientists, but I just didn't have the right occasion to do that. How does one section move to the other, or are the proportions equal, or is there a climax or something? Or Anytime I'm working with someone who doesn't know the field well, in particular an artist, they ask questions that make me look at autophagy in a slightly different way. Wendy asking me about the speed of certain parts of the process, which I had not thought about, but she needed to know with regard to the tempo of the music. I hadn't appreciated as much in that sense of being a climax, but it's clear that as it you know, gets to that point, and then all of a sudden it does change, and this boom, 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 boom. And we'd done paintings, we'd done the music. I had thought that a natural progression would, in fact, be to do dance. And some of the people that I was talking to said, well, you know, Peter Sparling, a professor of dance, is in our building. 
he played me Wendy's music, he showed me Dave's illustrations, and then he explained to me what autophagy was. And a red flag went up, and I thought, I don't want to have dancers mimicking what cells do. So I took directly from your Scientific American article those six major you know, processes. I hit upon some common denominators as Dan started describing the process, as if they were animated, as if they had wills of their own, and I thought, aha, this is it. This, this is a hook. Curl up, surround and engulf, seal, cut through, break down, and release back. It was fascinating to hear Peter's interpretation of autophagy. Does it mean that there is less energy or more resistance? Less energy of the organism to motivate itself through a space or more resistance? So, so we're kind of playing around with the illusion that dancers can create. He was asking questions and, and explaining how he was thinking about the process in ways that I had never imagined. But now we had to truly put it down on paper, as it were. What you have done is to provide me a script that can have multiple interpretations. I, I read a narrative into it. My role is largely as production director. I put the visual images and the music and the dance together. So what I'd like to do now is to show Dan and the folks what it is we're gonna film up at the video studio on the floor from above. Okay, so can we do that first? I asked Wendy if she would sit at the piano and play Macromusophagy. That then brought together the work that Wendy originally made, inspired by the cellular process, with the dance that I made, inspired by the same thing. And then stop right there, gals. I think that's where it would end in this version. Yeah. Thank you, Wendy. Hey. That's amazing. <laughs> We had never seen any aspect of the dance before. After it was over and we were walking back, we were discussing what did Peter mean by this part? Why were there these dancers in red high-heeled shoes, for example? Since it is not absolutely literal and not absolutely obvious what's being depicted at every step of the video, it fosters discussion. For the video version, we were able to go into the Deuterstadt video studio and shoot against green screen, and then remove their bodies against Dave's beautiful medical illustrations. It's as if the bodies are within a cell, and it becomes like animation. The cell carries out a dance of spring cleaning 365 days a year. As someone who's a neuroscience major, this is something very different than anything I've ever seen. I think it would be most helpful in a teaching environment for non-science students or people that aren't really uh, well-versed in science. Scientists are finally becoming aware of the fact that they need to do a better job of explaining what they do to the public at large. Funding is becoming tighter, more difficult to obtain. And the only way to possibly reverse that is to get more people to become supportive of basic research. That's all for now on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfeld Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. Music